challenge proceeding sensitization session for suppliers and contractors. I am Rhonda Joy Lewis, Corporate Communications Officer, and we are extremely pleased that you are able to participate in today's session. At this time, we recognize our Chairman and Procurement Regulator, Mr. Munilal Lalchan, and while he will not officiate today, he is available to take any questions that you may have at the end of today's session. The team who will be presenting today are Head of the Administrative Secretariat Review, Mrs. Tamara Maharaj, and Legal and Policy Research Officer, Ms. Shireen Sinanan. Before we begin the formal aspects of today's proceedings, please allow me to go through some helpful tips for a successful session. Please note that your mics will be muted. You can submit your questions via the chat option on the Teams platform, where it will be collated by our team and addressed in our question and answer segment at the end of the session. Please keep your contributions helpful and be considerate to our presenters and other participants. At the end of today's session, you will be invited to provide your feedback. Feel free to help us improve future sessions to better match your needs by letting us know what worked well and what didn't. Do note that this session is being recorded and will be shared via email and uploaded to our website. So without further delay, we now welcome our first presenter, Ms. Shireen Sinanan, who will take us through the first part of our agenda. Ms. Sinanan. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Good morning, everyone. I will be taking you through the introductory segment of our presentation today. The focus of our webinar will touch on concern the following areas, namely, who are we at the OPR, objectives of the Act, what are challenge proceedings and the governing laws and rules, who hears and determines challenge proceedings, who can submit a challenge, what can be challenged, what are the time frames for submitting an application for review? The standstill period, an overview and breakdown of the 20 day process for challenge proceedings, and appeals of the decisions of the hearing panel. OK, so let's get started. Who are we at the OPR? The Office of Procurement Regulation is a body corporate established pursuant to the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act No. 1 of 2015 as amended. There were three amendments to the Act, the first one being in 2016, the second in 2017, and the third in 2020. The Act aims to provide for public procurement and for the retention and disposal of public property. Please note that pursuant to Section 13, Subsection 2B of the Act, the Office, in exercising its functions, shall not be subject to the direction or control of any other person or authority in the performance of its functions, but it shall be accountable to Parliament. So let's now move on to the objectives of the Act. Pursuant to Section 5.1, the objectives of the Act are to promote a the principles of accountability, integrity, transparency, and value for money, b efficiency, fairness, equity, and public confidence, and c local industry development, sustainable procurement, and sustainable development in public procurement and the disposal of public property. One of the mechanisms built into the Act for carrying out these objectives is the challenge process. There is a lot of dialogue about the Act lately, centering on proclamation, but also concerning the concepts of bringing challenge proceedings. So let's now look at what are challenge proceedings. Challenge proceedings is a process by which a supplier or contractor who is the applicant may apply to the office for a review of a decision or action taken by a procuring entity, the respondent in a procurement proceeding. To do so, the supplier or contractor must submit an application for review to the office, further to section 50, subsection one of the act. The procedure is governed by 
Part 5 of the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act No. 1 of 2015. The Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Challenge Proceedings Regulations 2021. The Hearing Rules and Procedure for Part 5 Challenge Proceedings. And the Electronic Hearing and Filing Rules for Part 5 Challenge Proceedings. The Act and the Regulations can be found on our website and the hearing rules and electronic hearing rules will be uploaded soon. So now that you know what are challenge proceedings, let's see who can bring these proceedings. Please you on to section 49, subsection 1 of the Act. A supplier or contractor may bring challenge proceedings where it is alleged that A. A procuring entity made a decision or took an action that is not in compliance with this act and b the supplier or contractor has suffered or is likely to suffer loss or injury because of the decision or action of the procuring entity please note the use of the word and in order to bring a challenge against the decision of the procuring entity the supplier or contractor must satisfy both a and b now let's look at who hears and determines challenge proceedings. The office has established hearing panel to, de to, to hear and determine challenge proceedings. The hearing panel will comprise of members of the board and management of the office of no less than three and no more than five who are selected by the office for their competence in the specific areas of disputes. And one of these members will be appointed to chair the hearing. So what are, the, what are the types of challenges that may be brought before the panel? As stated earlier, suppliers or contractors can challenge decisions or actions taken by a procuring entity in procurement proceedings that are not in compliance with the Act. As such, challenges can relate to four particular circumstances, namely, one, the terms of pre-qualification or decisions or actions taken in pre-qualification proceedings. For example, a failure to respond to a supplier's request for clarification of the pre-qualification documentation within a reasonable time to enable the supplier to present an application in a timely manner. Two, the terms of pre-selection or decisions or actions taken in pre-selection proceedings. So for example, where a maximum number of contractors to participate in a procurement activity is specified and the supplier is not listed without proper justification or the maximum number is exceeded. The third circumstance relates to the terms of solicitation. For example, the terms of reference or specification favors one supplier, product or brand. And fourthly, other decisions or actions taken in a procurement proceeding. For instance, accepting late bids without proper justification and without notifying the other bidders. At this juncture, it would be insightful to go through the definitions of pre-qualification, pre-selection and solicitation as defined under Section 4 of the Act, especially in light of the major part they play in challenge proceedings. Pre-qualification means the procedure prior to solicitation. Sorry, the procedure to identify prior to solicitation suppliers or contractors who are qualified. Pre-selection means the procedure to identify prior to solicitation a limited number of suppliers or contractors who best meet the qualification criteria for the procurement concern. And solicitation means an invitation to tender, present submissions, or participate in request for proposal proceedings or an electronic reverse auction. So just to piggyback a bit, I would have previously mentioned the four circumstances that challenges can relate to. In this regard, Please note that these challenges must be filed before the time frame specified in Section 50, Subsection 2 of the Act. So what are these time frames? 
in the first three circumstances mentioned in the previous slide, where the challenge relates to the terms of pre-qualification, pre-selection or solicitation, or the decisions or actions taken by a procuring entity in pre-qualification or pre-selection proceedings, the deadline to file this challenge is before the deadline for presenting submissions. Where, however, the challenge relates to other decisions or actions taken by a procuring entity in procurement proceedings, the deadline to file this challenge depends on whether or not a standstill period was applied by the procuring entity. If a standstill period was applied, the deadline to file this challenge is within the standstill period. If, however, a standstill period was not applied, the deadline to file this challenge is within seven working days after the publication of the notice or decision of the decision or action, sorry, that was taken by the procuring entity. So some of you may be wondering what exactly is the standstill period, so let's find out. This diagram illustrates the standstill period process. The standstill period is a short pause of 10 to 15 working days in duration, which begins when the notice of decision to award is issued to participating suppliers or contractors. In the procurement cycle, the standstill period occurs before the issuing of the notice of acceptance to the successful bidder. According to Section 35, Subsection 2, a procuring entity shall promptly notify each supplier or contractor who presented submissions of its decision to accept the successful submission at the end of the standstill period. The duration of the standstill period is calculated based on the form of communication the procuring entity intends to use to transmit the notice to the supplier or contractors. A 10-day standstill period is to be used if the notice is to be dispatched via email and 15 days where the notice will be sent via letter, mail, or reliable courier. If the standstill period, the standstill period begins at one minute after midnight on the day of dispatch of the notice of decision to award and ends at midnight on either the 10th working day after the notice is communicated electronically or the 15th working day from the date of sending the notice via letter, mail, or a reliable courier. In this particular example, the standstill duration is 10 working days, which is the minimum requirement of the public procurement and disposal of public property evaluation regulations 2021. If no challenges or applications for review are made within the 10 day period in this example, then the procuring entity is free to award the contract or framework agreements. If an application for review or challenge is received by the office, however, this would initiate challenge proceedings. So thank you everyone for your attention thus far, and I will now hand you over to Mr. Mara Maharaj. Thank you, Ms. Cinnamon, and good morning, everyone. I will now take us through the challenge proceedings process at the office, which starts from the moment an application for review is submitted and ends when the final decision is made by the hearing panel on the grounds raised in the application for review. As you can see, it is referred to as the 20 day process. This is because section 50, subsection 11 of the Act stipulates that the office shall issue its decision within 20 working days after receipt of the application for review. The office then has 30 working days to provide written reasons for its decision in accordance with section 50, subsection 12 of the Act. As we will continue to see in the following slides, there are steps to be taken by the parties and the office each day of the process in order to achieve completion and decision by day 20. The office would therefore be constrained to maintain the timeframes in this process 
and requests for extensions of time at various junctures may rarely be accommodated. On the days not specifically highlighted, the office will be conducting its internal preparations for the hearing or other deliberations to determine the matter by day 20. So let's now turn to the first three days of the process. We will be focusing on the areas which suppliers and contractors should take note of as they navigate the process before the office. So day one of the challenge proceedings process begins with the submission of an application for review to the office by an applicant. As explained earlier by Ms. Sinanon, an applicant is a supplier or contractor who participates in procurement proceedings that are being conducted by a procuring entity and satisfies the requirements of Section 49 of the Act. In terms of the procedural aspects of the documents and communications involved during this process, in an effort to maintain simplicity and uniformity, the office has created prescribed forms which are to be used throughout the proceedings. So, for example, the application for review is Form 8. We will go through the details of this form in the next few slides. Additionally, the office has created an email platform to receive submissions by the parties to challenge proceedings upon proclamation. This email address is challenge at opr.org.tt and it will be the medium through which the OPR officer, who is designated as the hearing secretary, will communicate with the parties and vice versa. Once an application for review is filed via this email address, a case reference number will be assigned to the matter and the applicant will be informed of, the, of it via email. Every subsequent submission of forms or correspondence to the office must include the case reference number in the identical format in the subject line of the email. So there should be no spaces or full stops between the characters of each case reference number. Also note that documents submitted to the office for filing must be emailed between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. on working days. Where documents are sent outside the prescribed time without the permission of the hearing panel, the sender will receive an email from the office stating that his email will be returned and must be filed within working hours on working days. If documents are submitted on public holidays, the filing date will be stamped as the next business day. So once an application for review is received by the office on day one, the office will take the following steps within the first three days. It will publish a notice of the application in two daily newspapers and on its website. And it will notify the procuring entity of the application via email to the accounting officer or equivalent and the name procurement officer of the respondent procuring entity. Let's now take a closer look of Form 8, the application for review. So this is a snapshot of what the Form 8 application for review looks like. The forms will be posted on the OPR's website shortly, so you can download and familiarize yourself with the information to be provided to the office. We will now look at some of the key details of this form. So the key information that the applicant has to provide in the Form 8 is as follows. Firstly, each decision or action of the procuring entity which is being challenged and the date of that decision or action. Secondly, the facts surrounding each decision or action so that the office can have a context of the events. This includes details about the solicitation documents, the goods, works or services being procured, the deadline for submissions, 
Details on the standstill period that was implemented as may be applicable to the circumstances of the matter. The grounds or basis of the of the office to review the decision or action taken by the procuring entity must also be stated. That is, what is the non-compliance or breach being alleged by the applicant? If multiple decisions or multiple actions are being challenged, the grounds for review of each decision or action must be stated. Fourthly, the remedies being sought from the office in keeping with the powers of the office under section 50 subsection 10. For example, the applicant may seek the overturning of a, an award of the contract or framework agreement, or he may seek the termination of the procurement proceedings or bid preparation course or costs relating to the application for review. The applicant must also list the witnesses to be presented on his behalf at the hearing in support of the facts and matters stated in the application for review. Also, efforts taken to resolve the issue directly with the procuring entity must be stated. The office encourages parties to dialogue before the matter is escalated to the point of filing an application for review. The issue may be easily <coughs> resolved, for example, where there is a simple mathematical error in the tallying of evaluation scores and engaging in dialogue can avoid the initiation of challenge proceedings and its consequential costs and delay in the procurement process. Applicants are therefore encouraged to engage with the procuring entity first to clarify or lodge a complaint. The details of this dialogue can be provided and attached to the Form 8 if the matter is not resolved with the procuring entity. However, suppliers and contractors must be mindful of the timeframes to file the application for review, as we saw in the previous slides, to ensure the application is filed if the matter is, remains unresolved as the deadline approaches. As a point to note, the office has prepared instructional guides on how to complete all the prescribed forms to assist parties to challenge proceedings, and these will also be uploaded to our website shortly. So turning now to the documents to be provided in support, Form 8 lists the following examples of information that can be attached depending on their relevance to the matters raised in the application for review. These supporting documents include invitation to bid, request for proposal or quotation, invitation for pre-qualification or pre-selection, notice of intention to award issued by the respondent, the bid submitted by the applicant, request for clarification received from the applicant, correspondence between the applicant and respondent in in relation to efforts taken to resolve the issue directly with the respondent. Emails, correspondence or other documents relevant to the decision or action being challenged. Note that not only are these supporting documents to be listed in the body of Form 8, but copies of these must also be attached. Failure to attach any relevant documents can result in the inability of the applicant to rely on these at the hearing. It should also be noted that Form 8 allows redaction of information relating to categories set out in Section 52 of the Act. This is information which, if disclosed, would either A, impair the protection of essential security interests of the state, B, be contrary to law, C, impede law enforcement, D, prejudice the legitimate commercial interests of the suppliers or contractors, or E, impede fair competition. The office intends to issue guidelines on how reduction pursuant to section 52 should be undertaken. So we see how much information is required from the applicant 
from very early in the process. This front end loading, so to speak, is to enable the office to be apprised of all the material facts and matters as early as possible so that challenge proceedings can be completed within the statutorily imposed 20 day deadline. When Form 8 and the supporting documents are submitted to the office, the hearing secretary will subsequently email a stamped copy of the document to the party that submitted it. This indicates that the document has been filed with the office. This filed version of all documents bearing the OPR stamp must be served on the procuring entity, the respondent. Once served, Form 1 confirmation of service must be submitted to the office through the same email, email platform, that is challenge at opr.org.tt with the case reference number in the subject line. If there was personal service, a copy of the endorsed document must be attached to the Form 1. This is the copy where the person who receives the file document signs and dates the first page showing that the original was received. If there was electronic service, a copy of the email showing the electronically delivered document must be attached to the Form 1. This confirmation of service Form 1 has to be submitted through the email platform when the file documents are served on the other parties throughout the proceedings. Another form that the applicant should be aware of at this stage is a Form 2 Notice of Appointment of a Representative. A party can engage a representative to act on its behalf during the challenge proceedings. A representative can be an attorney at law or such other suitably qualified or experienced person, which may include, but is not limited to, an engineer, quantity surveyor, valuator, agent, or such other person as shall be recognized by the office for the purpose of representation in accordance with regula Regulation 7. Where a representative is engaged, this Form 2 must be filed with the office and be served on other parties. Turning to days 4 to 6 now, as shown in this slide, there are four main activities highlighted during this period which the applicant should be aware of. These relate to suspension, dismissal, the reply, and the application to participate. So let's first look at the issue of suspension. Section 50, subsection 4 of the Act empowers the office to suspend either the procurement proceedings before the entry into force of the procurement contract or the performance of a performance procurement contract or the operation of a framework agreement that has entered into force. The office can determine the length of the suspension for as long as it finds necessary to protect the interests of the applicant. This power of suspension may be exercised by the office within three days of receipt of the application for review. The office will notify the parties of its decision on suspension between day four and five. Reasons for the decision will be provided by day seven in accordance with section 50, subsection six and subsection seven of the act. The second area highlighted in this slide is the issue of dismissal. Regulation four empowers the office to dismiss an application for review and lift any suspension that is in effect in three circumstances. Namely, where the office is of the opinion that the application is manifestly without merit or where it was not presented in compliance with the timelines set out in section 52 of the Act or the applicant has not demonstrated sufficient standing by way of a pecuniary or otherwise economic interest in the procurement proceedings. 
where the office exercises its power to dismiss the application in those circumstances, it will promptly notify the applicant, the procuring entity, and all qualified suppliers and contractors in the procurement proceedings of the dismissal with reasons. The third activity is the submission of the reply by the respondent. Under Regulation 9.1, within three working days of the receipt of the notification that an application for review was submitted to the office, the respondent must submit a written reply and documentary evidence in support to the office. Transcribing this time frame into the 20 day process, it means that the latest day for the submission of the reply and supporting documents to the office is day six. It should be noted that under Regulation 9.5, the respondent may request that the office authorize it to award a procurement contract or enter into a framework agreement on the grounds that a delay in the award of the procurement contract or entering the framework agreement would be contrary to the public interest or such other consideration which would justify the procurement contract being awarded or the framework agreement being entered into while the office conducts its review. This request may be submitted to the office at the time the respondent provides its written reply, reply to the office. The fourth activity during day four to be aware of is that interested parties can apply to participate in an ongoing challenge proceedings by submitting a Form 10 application to participate to the office. This is to be done by day six. An interested party is someone falling in the categories set out in Section 51, Subsection 1 of the Act. That is, one, any supplier or contractor who participates in the procurement proceedings to which the application for review relates, or any public body whose interests are or could be affected by the application for review. Some points to note for suppliers and contractors who join ongoing challenge proceedings as interested parties are as follows. One, an interested party is restricted to the grounds of challenge and remedies contained in the application for review that was filed by the applicant. Two, a supplier or contractor who participated in the same procurement proceedings that are being reviewed and who wishes to raise other grounds of challenge or seek remedies specific to them must file their own application for review form 8 within the time frame set out in section 52 of the act and finally interested parties will have to bear their own costs while participating in an ongoing challenge proceeding so we know that a lot of content is being shared as we go through the 20-day process we will now pause for a 10-minute break at this juncture and when we resume we will look at what happens from day eight onwards. Thank you stakeholders for rejoining our sensitization session on challenge proceedings. As we continue with the 20 day process, we now turn to days eight and nine. So between eight and nine, the office will provide the parties with the following. Firstly, a notice of case management conference, which will state the following key information. The date, time, place, and purpose of the CMC, whether parties are required to attend in person, that they may be represented by a representative, but that person must have the authority to make agreements and give undertakings on behalf of the party at the CMC, that if a party does not attend either themselves or through a representative, the presiding member of the hearing panel may proceed in their absence. And lastly, the notice of CMC will have a statement that binding orders would be made by the hearing panel 
with respect to the conduct of challenge proceedings. Secondly, during this period, if the respondent requested an authorization to award a procurement contract or enter into a framework agreement, the decision on this request would be provided. Thirdly, if an interested party submitted an application to participate, the decision on this application would be provided, as well as decisions on all other applications which were filed earlier. It is to be also noted that if a party seeks to have an expert provide evidence at the hearing in support of their case, the application for leave or permission to call expert evidence must be filed between days 8 and 9. So let's turn now to the area of expert evidence. This is a snapshot of the Form 11 application for leave to call expert evidence. We will now look at some of the key details to be provided in this form. The first point to note is that a party must first seek the permission or leave of the hearing panel to call or adduce expert evidence at the hearing. Expert evidence must be reasonably be required to resolve the challenge proceedings justly and in accordance with the overriding objective of the hearing rules and procedures for challenge proceedings. The overriding objective is to enable the hearing panel to deal with cases fairly and justly, having regard to various considerations, including dealing with the case in ways which are proportionate to the importance of the case, the complexity of the issues, the anticipated costs and the resources of the parties, and to avoid delay so far as is compatible with proper consideration of the issues to be determined in challenge proceedings. So the Form 11 application for leave to call expert evidence must include the details such as the name, address and qualifications of the proposed expert, the issue on which the expert will provide evidence, the substance or summary of the relevant points of the expert's evidence, any list of documents to which the expert will refer, and the grounds for the application for leave or permission to call this expert witness. Day 11 is the day scheduled for the case management conference on the matter. At this conference, the hearing panel can, after giving the parties an opportunity to make representations, make orders with respect to the conduct of challenge proceedings. Some examples of these orders relate to the simplification or clarification of issues, disclosure of documents, facts or evidence that may be agreed upon, preliminary matters, skeleton submissions, scheduling the hearing date, and the resolution of any or all of the issues in the challenge proceedings. By day 11, parties must also inform the office if any of the following situations apply. Firstly, if the assistance of an interpreter is required, this is to be done by submitting Form 6, Notice of Requirement of an Interpreter. It should be noted that arrangements to retain and utilize the services of an interpreter is to be borne by the party submitting this notification to the office. Secondly, if accommodation is required for differently abled persons to attend the hearing, Form 7, Notice of Requirement of Accommodation, must be submitted by Day 11. Between days 11, days 12 to 13, the office would provide a notice of the directions or orders that were made at the CMC, as well as provide the date, time, place of the hearing to all the parties. 
the party requiring the assistance of an interpreter must submit the qualifications of the chosen interpreter to the office during this period. And thirdly, all parties must file and serve their respective witness statements, expert evidence if applicable, and skeleton submissions during days 12 to 13. So let's take a look at the details to be provided in witness statements. From the perspective of the applicant, a witness statement must provide an account of the facts in support of the claims contained in the application for review. It can refer to and attach any relevant supporting document. Note, however, that these documents must have been attached to the Form 8 application for review at the beginning of the proceedings. The witness statement must also include a statement that the matters set out therein are within the witness's own knowledge, except where otherwise indicated, and the contents are true and correct. Finally, it must be signed and dated by the witness. A party who fails to provide a witness statement in accordance with the hearing rules and procedures for challenge proceedings may not call the, wit the person as a witness without the leave of the hearing panel. Where expert evidence is allowed by the hearing panel, the expert must provide independent assistance to the hearing panel by way of an objective, unbiased opinion in relation to the matters within his expertise. And he must follow the guidelines contained at Schedule 1 of the hearing rules and procedures for challenge proceedings. Some of these guidelines are that the expert witness must not change his opinion or change or withhold information to suit the position taken by the party that has retained or employed him. The expert also has duties of disclosure, such as the responsibility to make full and fair disclosure, making it clear when a particular question or issue falls outside of his area of expertise. And where the opinion and evidence are based on information contained in other documents, detailed references should be provided in the report prepared by the expert and copies of those documents should be attached to his report. Turning now to skeleton submissions, these are a summary of the arguments in support of the matters stated in the application for review in relation to the allegation that the respondent made a, a decision or took an action that is not in compliance with the Act and that the applicant has suffered or is likely to suffer loss and injury because of the decision or action of the procured entity. In essence, the skeleton submissions provide the framework for the oral closing submissions of the applicant at the hearing. Now, day 14 is not highlighted in the slide as the applicant is not required to file any documents at this point. However, the parties and hearing panel will be preparing for days 15 to 16, which is the hearing of the application for review. Some points to note about the hearing. All hearings will be public. The only exception is where Section 52 circumstance applies as mentioned earlier. All parties are required to attend the hearing. Non-attendance by a party will not prevent a hearing panel from continuing with the hearing in that party's absence where it is satisfied that the notification of the hearing was received and the party is absent without good cause. At the hearing, the applicant will present its case and call witnesses who can be questioned by the other parties and the hearing panel. The respondents and interested parties, if any, will follow the same process. Each party will then be given the opportunity 
to make oral closing submissions to the hearing panel. It should be noted that the hearing is the latest time at which an applicant can make an application for cost form 18, form 15, in accordance with the hearing rules and procedures. If such an application is made, the respondent will be given an opportunity to make representations on sale. After the hearing, the hearing panel will meet between days 17 to 19 to deliberate on the evidence provided. It will formulate its decision by day 20, as stipulated under Section 50, Subsection 11 of the Act, and immediately thereafter, communicate its decision to all parties and other participants in the procurement proceedings. All persons shall comply with the decision and directive of the Office. Written reasons will be provided no later than 30 days after the decision in accordance with Section 50, Subsection 12 of the Act. If the procurement proceedings were suspended, this order of suspension shall be lifted immediately upon the issuance of the decision of the hearing panel on day 20. By day 30, Parties can apply for the record of the hearing via Form 16, and this record will be in an electronic format. So this brings us to the end of the 20-day challenge proceedings process. You would recall that as we went through that process before the office, a decision can be issued relating to the suspension of the procurement proceedings by day three, then a final decision on the substantive matter will be issued by day 20. A party who is dissatisfied with and has an interest in these orders or decisions can appeal to the Public Procurement Review Board by requesting a review of the decision of the office. This is the review mechanism provided for under sections 51A to L of the Act. A request for review to the Review Board must be made within 21 days of receiving the order or decision of the OPR's hearing panel, and the Review Board may dismiss a request for review that it believes is frivolous or vexatious. So within 21 days of receiving this request, the review board must meet to conduct a review, which must be completed within 28 days. The review board can take two broad forms of actions upon completion of its review. It can confirm, vary, or overturn the decision of the OPR's hearing panel, and it can order the payment of costs as between parties to the review. If a party still feels aggrieved at this stage, they can subsequently appeal against the decision of the review board to the High Court within 28 days of the making of the decision. So this brings us to the end of the formal presentation on challenge proceedings before the OPR and the appeal mechanisms thereafter as contained in the Act. I thank you for your attention.